YouTube as we go into another wonderful word on Wednesday. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. And we want to direct your attention this morning to the book of Psalm, the 40th number. And we're going to look at a few verses, beginning with verse number 1. Psalm 40, beginning with verse number 1. And I'm going to be reading in your hearing this morning from the New King James Version. Psalms 40, beginning with verse number 1, and we have it, and reads on this wise. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Just want to use as a topic for our lesson today, the process of waiting. The process of waiting. I can just just let folks know, sometimes you just have to wait. Sometimes you just have to wait. Now, contrary to popular belief within contemporary theology, we don't teach and preach too much about a waiting God. We kind of teach and we kind of preach more about a right now God. And then we'll say something to the effect, he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. It sounds good, but the truth of the matter is, God is not always a right now God. Perhaps some of you found out in your own life's experiences, you prayed and prayed, and God hasn't come hasn't come yet. You prayed and you expressed your faith and you come to church every Sunday and every Wednesday and Lord knows you give your tithe, you support your pastor, you're, you're a strong worker in your ministry work and you've been part of a great opportunity, you've been a good steward in the church and even at home. But still, at the same time, we have to realize God is not always a right now God. Maybe we need to understand that this is not from the aspect of its outcome, but it's from the aspect of its authority. Simply put, God makes us wait because He can. He's sovereign. And He makes us wait, first of all, because God pushes a pause on the plan for your life for His purpose. It's something that God is seeking to get from you, out of you, for His purpose. And then we have to see waiting simply as God being in control. I know sometimes we feel like we want to be in control and we got it all under control and we're going to get this thing taken care of, but God can let us know you have no power and you can't do anything without me and, and he'll make you wait. And that's what we find out in our text today here in Psalm 40, that we're not always on the right side of what we're looking at as it relates to being a patient, a patience to. For example, in this text, there's some things that 
just not, oh, this thing it kind of makes you wonder because when David says about being in a horrible pit, well, how did he get in the pit? Is a good question, first of all. Sometimes you wonder how do we get into things that we get into. Secondly, why is he in the pit? And then thirdly, who put him in the pit? Well, we go even further in our investigation. Where is the pit located? And then number five, look at it from this way. What is the dimensions of the pit? Is it deep? Is it wide? And because of these things, we can only speak on the things we do know, and that is simple. It was a pit, and it was horrible. So we have to walk within the context in which this text was written, and it doesn't always allow us to see the passage in its literal perspective. Sometimes we have to see passages in the literary perspective. And what I mean by this, this psalm is simply a mass of some traumatic event that happened in the life of David. Sometimes, you know, in conversations, people don't share exactly what they're going through, but they, they let you know, I'm, I'm just going through a whole lot of situations. That's the mass, and I'm actually sharing with you what happened. But they let me know that certainly something is going on in their lives and they are in a pit. So what we find out that David really doesn't care to talk about it in detail because he doesn't list it in this text. He just says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. And then after hearing my cry, he said he brought me up out of a horrible pit. Well, it almost as if David is viewing this as a man being buried alive. Something has happened in David's life that has really caused him a traumatic experience. And I just want to suggest that the worst tragedy of life really is to be dead before you die. The tragedy of life is to be dead before you die. Whatever David has experienced makes him feel like he's already been buried alive. Anybody ever been in a situation where you just said, oh my God, I wish I was dead. What is going on? Why am I experiencing all of this pain? What happened? Where did it come from? Why am I going through this? And we have to remember we have to remember that while he's in the pit, the pit really isn't the point. The pit is only the location of the subject and the verb. I'll say that again. The pit is only the location of the subject and the verb. The subject is waiting, and the verb is waiting. Y'all get that? The pit is only a place where both the subject and the verb are the same thing. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Because some of y'all may be, huh? What are you talking about, Pastor? What are you talking about? Well, if you go to a hospital, they're going to put you in a waiting room. Amen? The point of the waiting room is not the room. The point of the waiting room is to go in and wait until they come and provide a service. It's not the room, it's what you do while you're in there, which is the subject of why you're in there. The whole point of this passage is simple, to teach us what comes along with waiting on God. Well, there are some practical principles that are pertinent in this passage process of waiting. First of all, let's look at it. Number one, the type of behavior that you would exemplify while waiting on God. And it's right there in that very first verse, the A portion, where it simply says, I waited patiently 
for the Lord. I waited patiently for the Lord. That word patiently is the Hebrew word chaka. In other words, there is no real necessity for patiently because waiting is an act of patience alone itself. But the Hebrew language is placing double emphasis on this word. And it simply means that while I'm waiting, I wait. Make sense? While I'm waiting, I wait. David suggests that while he waited, he kept on waiting. And therefore, the behavior that is attached to his waiting is David's way of teaching us that waiting on God is the ability to not deny God while being delayed by God. See, sometimes people give up on God if it don't happen in a certain amount of time or a certain way. They'll make it sound as if God doesn't hear, God doesn't care, and then all of a sudden they just forget it and they lose faith. But this is simply David's way of teaching us that waiting on God is the ability to not deny God while being delayed by God. Because I just want you to know that delay does not mean being denied. Waiting in the Hebrew doesn't mean the same as it does in the English. In the English, it means to exercise patience, to be held up. And while you're being held up, you're being patient until something happens. That's what it means in the English. Waiting in the Hebrew text doesn't mean the same as waiting in the English. Waiting in the Hebrew means to twist and to bind, to stay together while you're being delayed. That while I was waiting, I didn't fall apart. That while God got me delayed, I didn't lose my mind. I didn't cuss nobody out. You all have mercy. I didn't mess up, I didn't go to drinking, I didn't go to getting high, I didn't fall apart. While I was waiting, God gave me the strength to keep it together while I was waiting. That's the behavior that is necessary while you're waiting on God. That we not fall apart and lose faith and just begin to just go crazy and lose our mind. That we need to have a certain behavior and that's the behavior that we need to keep it together, stay together while we're being delayed, while we're waiting on God. Secondly, here's the breakthrough of waiting. It's the breakthrough of waiting. The big portion of verse number one says, And he inclined to me and heard my cry. In other words, because I was waiting patiently, I didn't lose faith, I didn't lose my mind, I didn't fall apart, I didn't give up. He inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He inclined to me, and that word inclined simply means that God stretched himself to come to where I am without him moving from where he is. David came down to my, he says, he says, he came down to my pitiful situation without leaving his throne. Grandma used to put it this way, he, he, he sits high and he looks low. In other words, God came to where David was because David decided to turn his pit into a prayer closet instead of a pity party. So when he decided to start praying, and he, and, and he inclined unto me because that simply means he praying, he heard my cry, he's crying out to the Lord, and once again, he didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't give up, he kept on praying, and prayer is not just about God answering, it's about God hearing, hearing our cry. Amen? Well... Let's look at a couple of examples of that. In 1 Kings chapter 17, a woman's son was dying. Elijah was so happy to be at the house at the time of his death. And Elijah says to the woman, give me your son. And Elijah takes her son up into a room in the house away from everybody, stretches himself over the boy, and prays. 
and the boy came back to life. Elijah turned a death chamber into a prayer closet. What I'm, what I'm trying to say, I'm going somewhere, is that we got to learn how to turn our situations into prayer closets. In Matthew chapter 8, the disciples are in a storm, and Jesus is asleep on the boat. They started praying to Jesus, Master, do a thou care not that we are about to perish? Jesus wakes up from his sleep, silences the wind, steals the water, and the disciples made it out of the storm safely because they didn't wait to get out of the storm to pray, Lord have mercy. But they prayed while they were in the midst of the storm. Acts chapter 16, very familiar passage, we know that Paul and Silas was locked in prison. The Bible said at midnight, Paul prayed, Silas sung, and the jail began to, uh, jailhouse doors began to open. They didn't wait to get out of jail to pray. They prayed while they were in jail, and they turned that prison into a prayer ground. Well, on Friday, on Calvary, Jesus simply made, made, made a prayer request, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And three days later, he gets out of the grave because he put himself in God's hands while he was on the cross. He didn't wait till he got off the cross to pray. He prayed while he was on the cross. And all I'm trying to say is this. The worst place to be in is the best place to pray in. Amen? Said, and then he says, he brought us, he brought me up also out. He brought me out of this horrible pit. Listen. We got two options here that we can look at how this actually happened. First of all, we can look at when it says that he brought me up out of the horrible pit. We can look at it as God is standing outside the pit, drops a rope to David and says, I want to pull you up out of the pit. The problem with option number one is this. Option number one doesn't agree with systematic theology. Because every time God brought somebody out, he was never outside of what they were in. So we have to go to option number two. Option number two is, you got up out of the pit because he came down in. Mm. You got up out of the pit because God came down in. And God's got a record of getting folk out by going in. Y'all remember those three Hebrew boys in Daniel chapter 3? An old king looked in and saw, and said, I see four, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. He got them out because he got in. Same way with Daniel chapter 6 in the lion's den. What meant to be an all-you-can-eat buffet turned out to be an all-night sleepover because he got out because God got in. Waiting on God does have an end. Let me say that again. Waiting on God does have an end. The text says he got me up also out of a horrible pit. And bottom line, here it is. Out of the mighty clay, and then he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. So first of all, if you uh, if you behave while you're waiting on God, you got to wait on the breakthrough, you're waiting on the breakthrough, then there are some benefits, there are benefits for you when he brings you out. And here they are. First of all, he set my feet upon a rock. Then he established my steps. Then he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Not only did he bring you up also out of the whole pit, but also he brought you out of the mighty clay. 
And then God brings you out of the miry clay. He will set you on feet on a solid rock to stand. Not only will he establish your, your, your boys, but also he will render you a new testimony. He says, I'll establish your boys and I'll give you a new song. Maybe sometimes we need to change the songs that we sing. Amen. He gives us a new song that we'll have a new praise. Because when God does the miracle, God performs the great works in us, we should have enough, enough, enough in us to praise Him that others can see it and others can be able to understand why He serves such a powerful God. Because He always delivers. He always comes through in the case of calamity and situations and chaos in your life. And God is using us as a visual aid of victory. When God brings us through and God brings us out of situations, it's for others to see. And hopefully and prayerfully, they will hear a new song and watch how you praise the Lord. And, and the bottom line is, we need to understand that God is so mighty, but sometimes we just have to persevere in our trial because God will come. And then Isaiah said it this way, that they that wait upon the Lord, Lord have mercy, shall renew their strength. In other words, that means he'll give you restoration. They'll mount up with wings as an eagle. That means he'll give you elevation. They'll run and not get weary. That means that he will give you acceleration. And they'll walk and not faint. That means he'll give you duration. Whatever you do, do not give up on God. Wait patiently for the Lord. He will hear your cry. He will bring you out. And he will set your feet upon a solid rock to stand. And certainly he will establish your steps to go in a new direction. Give you a new outlook on life. And certainly you are appraising when God is able. When God does the miracle. When God brings you through. You are given praise so others may see. To God be the glory in all that has been done. Let us now pray. Father God, we thank you. And we are really, really understanding the importance of being patient and persevering in our trials and times of desperate situations. We just thank you, Lord, for giving us patience. Thank you for giving us the faith. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the trust that we need to continually believe and certainly know that you are there. You promised never to leave us, nor forsake us. And we just thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And truly, Lord, we love you. And we just ask that you continue to keep us, guide us, and lead us in the way that we should go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.